Chapter 2. The Four Gospels and Their Relation to the Church However they may differ in regard to minor details of their various systems, practically all ultra-dispensationalists are a unit in declaring that the four Gospels must be entirely relegated to a past dispensation, in fact, according to most of them, they are pushed two dispensations back, and, therefore, are not to be considered as in any sense, a common misconception of right dividers is that, by rightly dividing the word of truth, we throw away all scripture that does not belong to our current dispensation. That is utterly false. The reason people think this is because Christians, who are not right dividers, do this with everything written outside of Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews, Revelation. However, just because scripture is not written directly to us does not mean that we should discard it. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 to 17 says that all scripture is profitable. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6 and 10 11 tell us that what happened with Israel in the wilderness is written for our examples and in samples to learn from, not to directly apply to us today. Therefore, we read the Old Testament and learn from it, but we do not need to follow God's commands in the Old Testament, because they are not written to us. Christians will immediately object to my last statement. To my objectors I ask, were you saved by building an ark, like Noah was? Of course not because God did not command you to do so, even though he did command Noah in the Bible to do so, applying to this present age. If Ironside is applying Matthew John to today, is he telling everyone to sell what they have, Luke 12 verse 33, keep the law of Moses, Matthew 23 verses 1 to 3, which includes circumcision for males, an animal sacrifice in the temple for the firstborn son, and the ceremonial purification of a woman after childbirth, Luke 2 verses 21 to 24, be water baptized for salvation, Mark 16 verse 16, and endure unto the end in order to be saved, Matthew 10 verse 22. By contrast, Paul says, ye are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, Galatians 6 verse 15, and we have now received the atonement, Romans 5 verse 11, instead of receiving it at Jesus' second coming. Acts 3 verses 19 to 21, since all of God's word is true, John 17 verse 17, we must recognize the distinct ministry given to Paul as being directly applicable today, while not directly applying Matthew, John today. Otherwise, the Bible contradicts itself and is not God's word, since God cannot lie, Titus 1 verse 2, Hebrews 6 verse 18, dot. It is affirmed with the utmost assurance that the Gospels are wholly Jewish. Absolutely. Jesus said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24, and salvation is of the Jews, John 4 verse 22. Jesus told the twelve apostles, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6. Therefore, I have the utmost assurance from the Gospels themselves that they are wholly Jewish. By contrast, Ironside presents no scriptural proof that they are not wholly Jewish. Inasmuch as we are told in the Epistle to the Romans 15, 8, that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, the position is taken that the records of the evangelists deal solely with this phase of things and that there is nothing even in the utterances of our Lord himself in those books that has any special place for the present dispensation. Note how Ironside goes to Romans for the proof text without mentioning the proof texts I have given from the Gospels themselves. If Ironside is correct that we should follow the red letters in Matthew, John, why doesn't he provide a few examples of Jesus' utterances in Matthew, John that apply today? Jesus said, The meek shall inherit the earth, Matthew 5 verse 5. But, Paul said, our conversation is in heaven, Philippians 3 verse 20. Jesus talked about God's earthly kingdom, while Paul talks about God's heavenly kingdom. Thus, we need to listen to the instructions Jesus Christ gave us today through the Apostle Paul, rather than listening to the instructions Jesus gave to Israel, while on earth. I do not see Christians selling all that they have and having all things in common, as Jesus commanded, Luke 12 verse 33, and as the disciples obeyed, Acts 2 verses 44 to 47. 
Did Ironside take the proceeds from his books so that his church members could quit their jobs and live on his wealth? If not, he did not obey Jesus' command of go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Matthew 19 verse 21. Yet a careful consideration of the very passage in which these words are found would seem to negative this entire theory and prove that it is absolutely groundless, for when the Apostle is stressing true Christian behavior, he refers the saints back to the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus when here on earth. Notice the opening verses of Romans 15. We are told that the strong should bear the infirmities of the weak, and not seek to please themselves, but that each one should have in mind the edification of his neighbor having Christ as our great example, who pleased not himself, but of whom it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Romans 15 verses 1 to 7 is about the Romans following the example of Christ in that the Romans should have the mind of Christ in bearing the infirmities of the weak to strengthen them. However, Romans 15 verse 8, which is the verse of Jesus Christ being the minister of the circumcision, begins a new topic that goes through Romans 15 verse 13. That topic is that, since Jesus Christ confirmed the promises made unto the fathers, then we should abound in hope, through the power of the Holy Ghost, Romans 15 verse 13. In other words, because Jesus Christ came and fulfilled God's law covenant with Israel, we, as members of the body of Christ, can have the confident expectation that God will also fulfill the promises made to us today in the dispensation of grace. We are then definitely informed that not only what we have in the four Gospels, but what we have in all the Old Testament is for us, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Absolutely, those things were written aforetime, for our learning. It does not say, for our obedience. All scripture is profitable. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, however, just because it is all profitable does not mean it is all directly applicable. If everything is directly applicable, I can pick up deadly snakes and drink poison without being harmed. Mark 16 verse 18, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. More importantly, I can lay hands on the sick, and they will be healed. I know of no bona fide healer like this today. How, then, can we apply Mark? 1618 to today? And, if Ironside wants us to follow the Old Testament, does he make sure he does not wear clothing with mixed fibers, Leviticus 19 verse 19, that he sacrifices animals, Leviticus 1, that he observes all of the feast days, Leviticus 23, and that he refrains from work on Saturdays, Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11? All scripture is profitable and for our learning, but it is not all for our obedience. Here there is no setting aside of an earlier revelation as though it had no message for the people of God in a later day simply because dispensations have changed. The mid-Acts position does not throw away all of the Bible except Paul's epistles. Rather, it considers what Paul says so that the Lord can give us understanding in the rest of the scripture, just like the Lord commanded us to do in 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. Spiritual principles never change, moral responsibility never changes, really? Then, why did God say to Israel, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, Deuteronomy 27 verse 26, but he said to us today that he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2 verse 14. Has Ironside built an ark to be saved from a worldwide flood like Noah? Has Ironside gathered up a group of Jews to go fight the Midianites like Gideon? Has Ironside taken a lifelong Nazarite vow to destroy the Philistines like Samson? These are things that God specifically commanded Noah, Gideon, and Samson to do, yet we recognize that they are not written for our obedience today. Why, then, won't Ironside recognize the same for the commandments that Jesus gave in Matthew John when scriptural evidence says they were only for Israel in their program, and the believer who would glorify God in the present age must manifest the grace that was seen in Christ, God's grace is being given eternal life, spiritual blessings, etc., that you do not deserve. God's grace was not seen in Christ's life, because Christ did not need it, since he lived a perfect life. The only thing God gave Christ that he did not deserve was God's wrath, not his grace, when he walked here on earth during the age that is gone. 
It is perfectly true that he came in exact accord with Old Testament prophecy and came under the law, in order that he might deliver those who were under the law from that bondage. How did Christ deliver Israel from the law? He told his disciples to obey the law, Matthew 23 verses 1 to 3, and, as late as Acts 21 verse 20, we see thousands of Jews, which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. If Jesus had eliminated the law for Israel, as Ironside claims, then they would not be zealous of the law, nor would Jesus have said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5 verses 18 to 19. Ironside rightly sees that we are not under the law today based on Paul's epistles, Romans 6 verse 14, but the information in Matthew John shows Israel still under the law, even after the cross. He was in reality a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, not observed to fulfill at his first coming the promises made unto the fathers, but to confirm them. This he did by his teaching and his example. The promises made unto the fathers was for Israel to rule and reign with Christ from Jerusalem over the Gentiles on earth. Jesus confirmed these promises would come to pass by dying on the cross so that God's wrath would be poured out on him, rather than on Israel, so that Israel may have eternal life in the kingdom. Thus, Jesus confirmed the promises made to Israel by his death and resurrection. His teaching and his example only showed his faith in the Father. They did not confirm the promises to Israel. Only the innocent, shed blood of the Lamb of God could do that. John 1 verse 29. He assures Israel even in setting them to one side, that the promises made beforehand shall yet have their fulfillment. Wait a minute, did Ironside just say that God set aside Israel? Ironside must not believe that God did that in Acts 2, because Peter preached in Acts 2 specifically to ye men of Israel, Acts 2 verse 22, and gave them a chance for their sins to be remitted, Acts 2 verse 38. When, then, did God set Israel aside? Would it not be in Acts 9 at the calling of Paul? But, observe, it is upon this very fact that the Apostle bases present grace going out to the Gentiles, not so. The Old Testament quotes here are referring to the Gentiles being blessed on earth where Jesus is ruling with Israel over the earth. We see this from Romans 15 verse 12. Paul's subject is having hope, Romans 15 verse 13, in the promises of God to the body of Christ so that they may walk in the Spirit. Thus, Romans 15 verses 9 to 12 are OT quotes so that we may abound in hope, Romans 15 verse 13, believing that God will present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, Ephesians 5 verse 27. This belief is based on the scriptural evidence in Israel's program that was written for our learning, Romans 15 verse 4, that God is faithful to complete what he started as evidenced by the crosswork of Jesus, for he adds in verse 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again, he saith, rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Esaias saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. There. 9 to 12. Here, while not for a moment ignoring that revelation of the mystery of which he speaks in the closing chapter, Paul shows that the present work of God in reaching out in grace to the Gentiles is in full harmony with Old Testament scripture, while going far beyond anything that the Old Testament prophets ever dreamed of, exactly. That is what the mystery is all about. God promised eternal life in his kingdom on earth to Israel. That is all we see in the Old Testament. What was revealed to Paul, in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, Ephesians 4 verses 5 to 6. This is God's promise of eternal life in his kingdom in heaven to the body of Christ. This is in full harmony with Old Testament scripture, because God will still fulfill his promises of a kingdom to Israel. We are not spiritual Israel today while it goes far beyond the Old Testament by revealing the mystery that God will also fill the heaven with the body of Christ, and then he adds. 
Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Ver. 13. While there is a change of dispensation, there is no rude severing of Old Testament. By Ironside's definition, Jesus is guilty of rude severing of Old Testament, revelation within the same dispensation, as he read Isaiah 61, 1-2a and then closed the book before finishing the passage, showing that the first part applied to his first coming, while the second part applies to his second coming. See Luke 4 verses 17 to 20. Jesus rudely severed Old Testament scripture in mid-sentence, or gospel revelation, from that of the present age. The one flows naturally out of the other, and the ways of God are shown to be perfectly harmonious. For Daniel 70 weeks, to be true, Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27, there has to be a severing. The natural flow is no break whatsoever between the Messiah being cut off and the tribulation period beginning. Daniel 9 verses 26 to 27 says the Messiah will be cut off, then the Antichrist comes, and then he makes a seven-year covenant with Israel, known as the tribulation period. History tells us there is at least a 2,000-year gap between the Messiah's being cut off and the Antichrist appearing on the scene. Thus, there must be a severing for God's word to be true. Since Jesus had no problem stopping his Old Testament reading in mid-sentence, I have no problem with the 2,000-year break in Daniel. This being so in connection with the Old Testament, how much more does the same principle apply in connection with the four Gospels? 2 Timothy 2 verse 7 says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. When we understand mystery doctrine given to Paul, we can now understand Old Testament and Gospel passages in their full light. There was no way to understand this before the mystery was revealed to Paul. Since both prophecy and mystery programs are part of God's reconciliation plan, it is all connected, which means that, all scripture is connected with each other. That is why the Holy Spirit teaches you the things of God through cross-referencing. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13 By saying that the Gospels are more connected with Paul's epistles than the Old Testament is, Ironside shows that he is not connecting all scripture with each other. He cannot make this connection, because he cannot understand scripture because he has not considered what Paul has said. Therefore, Ironside is guilty of the very thing he accuses his opposition of. At this point, we should also note that, just because man breaks up the Bible between Old and New Testaments, does not mean that is how God wants us to break it up. In fact, the New Testament or Covenant does not take place for Israel until Jesus' second coming, Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34. and Acts 3 verses 19 to 21. The way we rightly divide is not between Old and New Testaments, as that division has already been made for us, but it is between Paul's epistles and the rest of Scripture. While fully recognizing their dispensational place, and realizing that our Lord is presented in the three synoptics as offering himself as King and the Kingdom of Heaven as such to Israel, Matthew shows Jesus as King. Mark shows him as servant, Luke shows him as man, and John shows him as God. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar, because they all show Jesus as man. John is so different because it shows Jesus as God, only to meet with ever-increasing rejection, yet it should be plain to any spiritual mind that the principles of the kingdom which he sets forth are the same principles that should hold authority over the hearts of all who acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. Mid-Acts dispensationalists are not, by any means, rejecting principles of the kingdom found in Matthew John. Ironside keeps assuming that Mid-Acts dispensationalists throw out the entire Bible except for Paul's epistles, when, in reality, it is Ironside who throws away all of the Old Testament and all of Paul's epistles. As Mid-Acts dispensationalists, we recognize the instructions the Lord Jesus Christ gives us today are found only in Paul's epistles. The same principles apply, but the instructions are different. For example, God commanded Israel to believe and be water, baptized to be saved, Mark 16 verse 16, but that does not mean that I am saved by water baptism. I am saved today by believing that God will save me by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. The faith principle is the same in Matthew, John as it is today but the instructions to follow to be saved are different. In John's Gospel, the case is somewhat different, for there Christ is seen as the rejected one from the very beginning. 
It is in chapter 1 that we read, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Then based upon that, we have the new and fuller revelation which runs throughout that gospel of grace, flowing out to all men who have no merit whatever in themselves. Where does Ironside come up with the idea that John is a gospel of grace, flowing out to all men? The book of John has Jesus saying, Salvation is of the Jews, John 4 verse 22. Regarding the mystery revelation given to Paul, he said that God has broken down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, Ephesians 2 verse 14, and that there is no difference between Jew and Gentile today, Romans 10 verse 12. But in Matthew, which is preeminently the dispensational gospel, so, now Ironside is saying that Matthew is written to Israel for their dispensation, John is written to us today for our dispensation, and Mark and Luke are up for grabs. So, I guess we can now ignore everything that Jesus said in Matthew, keep the parts of Mark and Luke that we like and discard the others, but be sure to follow John. Isn't this a rude severing of the Gospels? I do not think Ironside knows what he believes. The Lord is presented as the son of David first of all. Then when it is evident that Israel will refuse his claims, he is presented in the larger aspect of son of Abraham in whom all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So, now Ironside is dividing the book of Matthew into two dispensations. He says that Jesus, as the son of David, will rule over the nations on the earth, but Jesus, as the son of Abraham, blesses all the nations, presumably in heaven. Yet, Genesis 12 verse 1 to 3 says that God will make a great nation of Israel first. Then, the nations of the earth are blessed by blessing Abraham. Thus, the distinction between Israel and the Gentiles is fully seen in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. In fact, we see the nations judged by Jesus Christ in Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46, according to this standard. How, then, can Ironside apply Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3 to us today, especially in light of Ephesians 2 verse 14, which says that the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile has been severed for us today? This shows a difference in treatment between Matthew and Ephesians. So, Ironside believes that Matthew 1 to 12 belongs to Israel's dispensation, while Matthew 13 to 28 belong to us today? I guess Ironside throws out the beloved Lord's Prayer and the Sermon on the Mount, because those are in the first 12 chapters of Matthew. The break with the leaders of the nation comes in chapter 12, where they definitely ascribe the works of the Holy Spirit to the devil. In doing this, they become guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, the crowning sin of that dispensation. Ironside needs to read Matthew 12 a little more carefully. Matthew 12 verse 24 says that the Pharisees attributed the works of the Son of Man, i.e., Jesus, to Satan. As such, they spoke a word against the Son of Man, Matthew 12 verse 32. He then warns them not to blaspheme the Holy Ghost in the future, because there is no forgiveness for that, Matthew 12 verse 32. In fact, Jesus says in John 16 verse 7 that he must ascend to the Father before the Holy Ghost is even sent. How could they have blasphemed the Holy Ghost when he was not even there yet? Rather, the warning of Matthew 12 verse 32 is that, when the Holy Ghost comes in Acts 2, if they reject his works at that time, as they rejected the Son of Man's works, Israel will be set aside. So, the Holy Ghost works through the believing remnant of Israel in the first seven chapters of Acts. Then, when Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, is stoned to death, Israel has blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Jesus, then, sets aside Israel's program and begins the dispensation of grace with Paul as the Apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, in Acts 9, which our Lord declares could not be forgiven either in that age or in the one to follow, not age, but world, meaning this heaven and earth versus the new heaven and earth to come, Revelation 21 verse 1. Most Bible scholars like to use the word age, because it lends credence to the new age movement. In chapter 13, we have an altogether new ministry beginning. The Lord for the first time opens up the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, revealing things that had been kept secret from the foundation of the world, namely the strange and unlooked for form that the kingdom would take here on earth after Israel had rejected the king and he had returned to heaven. Jesus does no such thing with his kingdom parables. After all of the instructions Jesus gave his disciples, including the 40 days he spent with them after his resurrection, 
The last the disciples say to him before his ascension is, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1 verse 6. Jesus' response is not, you guys are a bunch of dolts. Before and after my death and resurrection, I carefully gave you parables to teach you that God's kingdom is not on earth, but is in some strange unlooked for form in the hearts of men until I come back. And, now, after all of that, you still think the kingdom is going to be restored to Israel? No, instead Jesus says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, Acts 1 verse 7. Jesus does not address the issue of the kingdom being restored to Israel, because the disciples clearly understand that the kingdom will, in fact, be restored to Israel. He only addresses the issue of when this will take place. This is set forth in the seven parables of that chapter, and gives us the course of Christendom during all the present age. These seven parables tell the disciples what the kingdom of heaven is like. In fact, Jesus starts five of the parables by saying, the Kingdom of heaven is like Matthew 13 verses 31 and 33, 44, 45, and 47. Why would Ironside twist the word of God to say the parables give the course of Christendom during all the present age, when Jesus plainly says that the parables relate to the kingdom of heaven? Also, the gospels are entirely Jewish in nature and the dispensation of the gospel grace is a mystery hidden from the foundation of the world until Paul's day. Paul says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Ephesians 3 verses 3 and 5. Paul also says, My gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Romans 16 verse 25. By contrast, what Peter proclaimed in Acts 3 was something which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 3 verse 21. Therefore, if in Matthew 13, Christ spoke of the seven stages that Christianity would go through, he never told Peter, because Peter was preaching the same old message that had been preached since the world began. Also, Christ must have lied to Paul, when he said he revealed a mystery to him that was never before revealed to man. Therefore, Matthew 13 does not reveal any stages of Christianity. Rather, Christ is speaking to the kingdom dispensation with its promises of Israel ruling and reigning with Christ in God's eternal kingdom on earth. In other words, Christ has identified the believing remnant of Israel and is giving them the mysteries of the kingdom because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it is not given, Matthew 13 verse 11. As a rule, the ultra-dispensationalists would ignore all this, thank God for that. One would be extremely confused about scripture if they followed Ironside, and push these seven parables forward into the tribulation era after the church, the body of Christ, has been taken out of this scene. These parables make perfect sense in the tribulation period. How does Ironside make them make sense in the course of Christendom during all the present age? But this is to do violence to the entire gospel and to ignore utterly the history of the past 1900 years. Ironside is doing violence to God's plan as revealed in scripture by selfishly trying to take God's kingdom from Israel and give it only to the body of Christ. Just. As in Revelation 2 and 3, we have an outline of the history of the professing church presented under the similitude of the seven letters, so in Matthew 13 we have the course of Christendom in perfect harmony with the church letters, one would like to see Ironside attempt to prove this statement, portrayed in such a way as to make clear the distinction between the church that man builds and that which is truly of God. So, what is this clear distinction learned solely from Matthew 13? In chapter 16 of Matthew's Gospel, the Lord declares for the first time that he is going to build a church or assembly. Acts 7 verse 38 says that the church existed in the wilderness with Moses. Wherever there are believers in what God has told them, there is a church. It did not start with Jesus. This assembly is to be built upon the rock, the confession of the Apostle Peter that Christ is the Son of the living God. The rock is not Peter's confession. Rather, the rock, according to 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4, is Christ. If the church is built upon the rock of the confession of the Apostle Peter, then that rock fell before Jesus' crucifixion when Peter confessed three times that he did not know Jesus. Sounds to me more like shifting sand than a rock. 
How utterly vain it is to try to separate this declaration from the statement in the Ephesian epistle. We do not have to separate these verses, because God has already separated them by putting them in different books with eight books in between. Also, we can see these are different churches, because Jesus gave Peter the authority to keep people out of the kingdom, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven Matthew 16 verse 19. While Paul says that the offer of eternal life in the body of Christ is unto all and upon all them that believe, Romans 3 verse 22, where we read, Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. 2 colon 19-22 The two passages show a different foundation. This rock of Matthew 16 verse 18, upon which Christ will build his church, is Christ, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. The foundation, in Ephesians 2 verse 20, is the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. This foundation is the doctrine that Jesus Christ gave to the Apostle Paul, confirmed by the prophets of his day, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, to be the word of God with Christ's shed blood and resurrection being the chief cornerstone of the building. Here in the preeminent prison epistle of which so much is made by the Bullingerites, you find that the church then in existence is the church our Lord spoke of building when he was here in the days of his flesh, if they are one and the same, then let us not forget the next verse of Matthew 16 verse 19, which says that Peter has the power to forgive sins. If this passage is connected to Ephesians 2, then every pastor of every church has the power to keep people out of God's kingdom. We see Peter exercising this power when Ananias and Sapphira are struck dead in the church for lying to the Holy Ghost, Acts 5 verses 1 to 10. If this happened today, most Christians would have been killed by now, starting with the crooked pastors. The discipline of that church is given in Matthew 18 verses 15 to 20. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the midst of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to bear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. While the principle for dealing with a habitual sinner remains the same today, the ability to bind and loose in heaven and earth is not given to us today in the mystery dispensation. Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16, 18-19, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Also, today, it does not take two or three gathered in Christ's name for him to be with us. He is with us individually at all times with his indwelling Holy Spirit. In Matthew 16, you have the assembly as a whole, comprising all believers during the present dispensation. Here in chapter 18, you have the local assembly in the position of responsibility on earth and its authority to deal with evildoers in corrective discipline. The complete setting aside of Israel for the present age is given us in chapter 23, 37-39. This is not the setting aside of Israel for the present age. Just before his ascension, Jesus instructed his disciples to be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1 verse 8. He did not say, just go to the Gentiles. I'm not going to save Israel anymore. In Acts 2, Peter addresses his crowd as ye men of Judea, Acts 2 verse 14, ye men of Israel, Acts 2 verse 22, and let all the house of Israel know assuredly, Acts 2 verse 36. In reference to Israel, Paul asks the question, have they stumbled that they should fall? 
God forbid, Romans 11 verse 11. Romans 9 verses 32 to 33 tells us that Israel stumbled at the cross. They fell at the stoning of Stephen. Then, God started the dispensation of grace with Paul, but God still had not set Israel aside, as God commissioned Paul to also preach to Israel. He is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel, Acts 9 verse 15. Israel is not completely set aside by God until Acts 28. Israel stumbled at the cross, fell at the stoning of Stephen, and diminished away until Acts 28, Romans 11 verse 12, when Paul gave the proclamation, Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it, Acts 28 verse 28. Yet, Ironside says, the complete setting aside of Israel was done in Matthew 23, before the cross. Israel had not even stumbled at that point. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killst the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In the light of the words, your house is left unto you desolate, how amazing the presumption that would lead any to declare, as practically all these extreme dispensationalists do declare, that Israel is being given a second trial, throughout all the book of Acts, Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, Luke 23 verse 34. In saying this, Jesus is acknowledging that Israel crucified their Messiah out of ignorance, Acts 3 verse 17. As such, they should get a second chance. Luke 13 verses 6 to 9 tells of this second chance that Israel would get. This was for one year, from Acts 2 to 7. If Israel was set aside at the cross, why would Jesus, after the cross, instruct his disciples to be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Acts 1 verse 8. Why would Peter tell Israel that they could be saved by repenting and being water baptized, Acts 2 verse 38. Instead, he would have said, too late. So sorry, so sad. Also, we would not see thousands of Jews being saved in early Acts, Acts 2 verse 41. Their house being left desolate simply means that Jesus has swept it clean by casting out the evil spirit that is there, Matthew 12 verses 28 to 29. However, because of their unbelief, more wicked spirits will enter Israel, Matthew 12 verses 43 to 45, culminating in the Antichrist sitting in the temple, declaring himself to be God, 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 to 4 and that their real setting aside does not take place until Paul's meeting with the elders of the Jews after his imprisonment in Rome, as recorded in the last chapter of Acts. That is the Acts 28 position. I hold to an Acts 9 position. Israel's one-year grace period, Luke 13 verses 6 to 9, ends with the stoning of Stephen. Psalm 110 verse 1 says that Jesus would sit at his Father's right hand until God makes Jesus' enemies his footstool. Acts 7 verse 55 says that Stephen saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This shows that he was standing to judge Israel, Isaiah 3 verse 13. However, since Acts 7 verse 60 says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, God extends grace. To Israel again. God does put Israel's prophecy program on hold, beginning in Acts 9, with the call of Apostle Paul. But Paul is supposed to go to the Jews, as well, with the new, mystery gospel, Acts 9 verse 15, Romans 2 verse 11. Israel stumbled at the cross and fell at the stoning of Stephen. They then diminished away from Acts 9 through 28, Romans 11 verses 11 to 12, during the dispensation of grace. Therefore, Israel's program is set aside with the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, but Israel, as a whole, is not set aside until they reject the gospel of grace, given by the Apostle Paul, for the final time in Acts 28 verses 25 to 28. However, we should be careful to note that the mystery gospel began with the call of Paul in Acts 9, and it was the rejection of that gospel in Acts 28 that caused Paul to go to the Gentiles from then on. As such, no new dispensation began after Acts 28. The fact of the matter is that the book of Acts opens with the setting aside of Israel until the day when they shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. 
Again, if this were the case, Jesus would not have told his apostles to go to Israel in Acts 1 verse 8, and he would not have told Paul to go to Israel in Acts 9 verse 15. Throughout Paul's ministry in the book of Acts, we see him go to the Jew first and then to the Greek. There would be no mention of going to the Jews if Israel had been set aside at the beginning of the book of Acts. Jesus' statement that Israel's house is left unto them desolate, Matthew 23 verse 38, means that apostate Israel, which would be all those believing in the whole Jewish religious system of Jesus' day, will not be in the kingdom. They are the generation of vipers that cannot escape the damnation of hell, Matthew 23 verse 33. However, the believers in Israel are called the little flock, and Jesus says of them, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, Luke 12 verse 32, dot. That is his second glorious coming. In the interval, God is saving out of Israel as well as of the Gentiles, all who turn to him in repentance. Again, that dispensation did not start until the call of Paul in Acts 9. Regardless, I would use the term faith rather than repentance. Faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is what brings salvation in the current dispensation of grace. Repentance is true, also, because it means a change of mind. However, most people think of it as turning from your sins, which is an impossible task for man to do, as Romans 7 verse 18 says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So, instead of turning from your sins, God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 verse 8. In Matthew 24, we are carried on to the days immediately preceding that time when the Son of Man shall appear in glory, and we find the people of Israel in great distress, but a remnant called his elect shall be saved in that day. I pass purposely over chapter 25 as having no particular bearing on the outline, perhaps Ironside does not want you to see the judgment of the Gentiles in Israel's program in Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46. Otherwise, you may see that there are two programs of God, one, Israel, prophecy, and two, body of Christ, victory. Or, maybe he does not want you to see the two parables about the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 25 verses 1 to 30 and wonder, how do these parables fit in with the seven parables about the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 13? Are there really nine stages in the course of Christendom in the present age, instead of seven? because a careful consideration of it would take more time and space than is here available. How is Ironside limited by space? Seems like a pastor of a megachurch, such as his, would be able to afford supplying him with enough paper to complete his writing. The closing chapters give us the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then the commission of his apostles. People who have never investigated Bollingerism and its kindred systems will hardly believe me when I say that even the Great Commission upon which the Church has acted for 1900 years, and which is still our authority for worldwide missions, is, according to these teachers, a commission with which we have nothing whatever to do, that has no reference to the Church at all, and that the work there predicted will not begin until taken up by the remnant of Israel in the days of the Great Tribulation not just according to these teachers, but according to the Word of God, as well. As mentioned previously, Jesus commissioned his disciples to spread the gospel in Israel first, Acts 1 verse 8. Since ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come, Matthew 10 verse 23, Jesus himself tells us in the pages of Scripture that they were not to reach the Gentiles with the gospel until after Jesus' second coming. When Jesus interrupted this program and started a new program, the twelve apostles recognized this and said that they would confine their ministry to the circumcision, while Paul goes to everyone else with the gospel of grace, Galatians 2 verse 9. If the church has followed the commission of Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20 for the last 1,900 years, then they followed Satan's lie program, because the truth of God's word says that that commission has been put on hold. Besides, who would want to follow that commission when God has given us a better commission in the dispensation of grace? The Matthew passage has the disciples teaching the Gentiles to obey the law, which only teaches people to fear God. Today, we skip that step and go right into the gospel to reconcile men to God, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 to 20. Thus, 
Today, we have a greater commission than Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20, because people receive eternal life with our commission, while the twelve disciples were only given a step toward that in trying to get the Gentiles to obey God's law in the millennial reign. Why, then, would we even want to follow a weaker commission? People believe we should follow the commission of Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20. They have been bamboozled by the Christian religion into rejecting the testimony of the Word of God. And, just because the church has followed it for 1,900 years, does not mean we should follow it today. Our authority is the Word of God, not church history. Yet such is actually the teaching. In view of this, let us carefully read the closing verses of the Gospel. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. 28, 16-20 According to the Bullingeristic interpretation of this passage, we should have to paraphrase it somewhat as follows. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And after two entire dispensations have rolled by, I command that the remnant of Israel, who shall be living two thousand or more years later, shall go out and teach the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them in that day to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, but from which I absolve all believers between the present hour and that coming age, and lo, I will be with that remnant until the close of Daniel's seventieth week. Such an addition should not be made, because Jesus told his disciples that it is not for them to know when his kingdom will come, Acts 1 verse 7 It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power. The addition by Ironside is a mystery that was not revealed until Paul came along, Ephesians 3 verse 5. Such an addition, then, would make Paul incorrect in saying it was a mystery, perverting the word of God. That is why Jesus did not tell them these things, even though they are true, for the most part. But, the Great Commission also applied to the eleven apostles, not just to the future remnant of Israel. Can anything be more absurd, more grotesque and I might add, more wicked than thus, to twist and misuse the words of our Lord Jesus Christ? Ironside is the one who has changed the scripture, not me. He has failed to recognize the principle of progressive revelation found in the Bible. In view of all this, may I direct my reader's careful attention to the solemn statement of the Apostle Paul, which is found in 1 Timothy, chapter 6. After having given a great many practical exhortations to Timothy as to the instruction he was to give to the churches for their guidance during all the present age, the Apostle says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. 1 Timothy 6 verses 3-5 the warning is of Judaizers who insisted that salvation was kept by works. Why? Because that is how it was kept before the dispensational change that came with Paul's call. Paul says that anyone preaching the previous gospel of salvation plus works was to be accursed. Galatians 1 verses 8 to 9. Pride is in works, not in grace. This false gospel has continued from Paul's day until now. One would almost think that this was a direct command to Timothy to beware of bullyingerism. Actually, it is a command to beware of people who do not rightly divide the word of truth, which includes Ironside. Notice, Timothy is to withdraw himself from, that is, to have no fellowship with, those who refuse the present authority of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where do you get those actual words? Certainly in the four Gospels. Certainly not. What are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ? 
The phrase, Lord Jesus Christ, is found 81 times in Scripture. The first time it is ever recorded is in Acts 11 verse 17. That is because Jesus was not made both Lord and Christ until after his resurrection, Acts 2 verse 36. Therefore, the words of Jesus in Matthew John are not the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rather, they are the words of Jesus that the Father gave him to speak, John 12 verses 49 to 50. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ are the words that he gave to Paul. Therefore, the warning Paul gave Timothy is not to listen to those who would follow Jesus' words in Matthew, John. These people would be preaching another Jesus and another gospel by another spirit, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. Instead, they should follow the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, which are found in Paul's epistles. There are very few actual words of the Lord Jesus Christ scattered throughout the rest of the New Testament. John 1 verse 1 says that Jesus Christ is the Word, therefore, the entire Bible are His words, just because man. has put Jesus' words in Matthew, John and read does not mean they are any more important than any of the other words of his throughout the entire Bible. Of course there is a sense in which all the New Testament is from him, but the Apostle is clearly referring here to the actual spoken words of our Savior. How is that? The term Lord Jesus Christ specifically refers to the words he spoke after his ascension into heaven. This shows that the Apostle is clearly referring here to the actual spoken words of our Savior by revelation to the Apostle Paul. Furthermore, the doctrine which is according to godliness, 1 Timothy 6 verse 3, pertains to Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension according to 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, which is why the word godliness is not even mentioned in Scripture until 1 Timothy. Therefore, it has to refer to words spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ after his ascension. In fact, Jesus did not even let his disciples know of his death until Matthew 16 verse 21, and they were sent out preaching the gospel a little while before that, Luke 9 verse 6, which shows that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection were not even part of the gospel message that Jesus told his disciples to preach, which have been recorded for the benefit of the saints, and which set forth the teaching that is in accordance with godliness or practical piety. If a man refuses these words, whether on the plea that they do not apply to our dispensation, or for any other reason, the Spirit of God declares it is an evidence of intellectual or spiritual pride. Yes, it is very prideful to follow Jesus' words in Matthew, John, instead of the Lord Jesus Christ's words to us today in Romans, Philemon. Those who believe God and His Word will be directed by the Holy Spirit to ignore Jesus' instructions in Matthew, John. Such men ordinarily think they know much more than others, and they look down from their fancied heights of superior scriptural understanding with a certain contempt. Nah, what God is saying in 1 Timothy 6 verses 3 to 5 is that these people are proud that they figured out a way to cheat people out of money by using God to do it. That's why the passage goes on to say that, the love of money is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. Often not untinged with scornful amusement, upon godly men and women who are simply seeking to take the words of the Lord Jesus as the guide for their lives. But here we are told that such know nothing. but are really in their spiritual dotage, doting about questions and strifes of words. Yes, Christianity today is full of people who like to redefine words with the original languages or with different Bible translations, rather than getting the full meaning behind the passage. Hmm, didn't Ironside do that earlier with the word dispensation, only to violate his own definition when it suited his argument to do so? The dotard is generally characterized by frequent repetition of similar expressions. We know how marked this symptom is in those who have entered upon a state of physical and intellectual senility. Spiritual dotage may be discerned in the same way. A constant dwelling upon certain expressions as though these were all important, to the ignoring of the great body of truth, 
is an outstanding symptom. The margin, it will be observed, substitutes the word sick for doting. Word sickness is an apt expression. The word sick man overestimates altogether the importance of terms. He babbles continually about expressions which many of his brethren scarcely understand. He is given to misplaced emphasis, making far more of fine doctrinal distinctions than of practical godly living. Paul is merely saying that the dotard nitpicks over fine points and word definitions so that he does not have to address the bigger issues. It is what Jesus meant when he told the Pharisees that they strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, Matthew 23 verse 24. Such are people like Ironside, who redefine words, instead of just letting the words say what they say. Then, they use their redefinitions to change sound doctrine into a lie, while not addressing the surrounding context, which makes clear the meaning. As a result, his influence is generally baneful instead of helpful, leading to strife and disputation instead of binding the hearts of the people of God together in the unity of the Spirit. The well-known passage in the closing chapter of Mark's Gospel, which gives us another aspect of the Great Commission, having to do particularly with the Apostles, how did Ironside determine that only this part of the Great Commission applies particularly to the Apostles? He just got through criticizing ultra-dispensationalists for saying the Great Commission does not apply today, and now he is himself selectively not applying part of it today, saying that the miracle portion of the Commission only applied to the eleven apostles there. He does not have the liberty to pick and choose what he wants to apply today just because his lack of rightly dividing the word of truth precludes him from adequately explaining the Great Commission is a favorite battleground with the ultra-dispensationalists. Ignoring again the entire connection, they insist that the commission given in verses 15 and 18 could only apply during the days of the book of Acts, inasmuch as certain signs were to follow them that believe. As the commission in Matthew has been relegated by them to the great tribulation after the Christian age has closed, this one is supposed to have had its fulfillment before the present mystery dispensation began and so has no real force now. Regardless of the gospel book, signs, and miracles apply during the book of Acts and in the still future tribulation period. This is not an arbitrary distinction to fit a belief system. Rather, it is the recognition that physical miracles are a distinction of Israel's program only. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22 says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Since God made Jews to desire signs, God gives them signs in their dispensation. The healing of the sick, casting out devils, taking up deadly things, and drinking poison of Mark 16, then, are signs for Israel to believe the gospel of the kingdom and be saved. When God starts the dispensation of grace with Paul in Acts 9, the sign gifts continue for to provoke them to jealousy, Romans 11 verse 11. In other words, although the dispensation has changed, God still wants Israel to be saved in the dispensation of grace. Therefore, he continues physical miracles during the diminishing away period of Israel, which is Acts 9 to 28. Once Israel is completely set aside at the end of Acts 28, the sign gifts cease. This view makes sense in light of scripture, and it is also what we observe. For example, in Acts 19 verses 11 to 12, in the dispensation of grace, many people are healed by the hands of Paul. Yet, after Acts 28, we see Paul saying, But Trophimus have I left at my leadum sick, 2 Timothy 4 verse 20. Since we are on the subject of the Great Commission, I mentioned earlier that Matthew shows Jesus as king, Mark shows Jesus as servant, Luke shows Jesus as man, and John shows Jesus as God. The commissions given by Jesus to his disciples in those books show the exact same thing of the believing remnant of Israel. Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20 shows them as king of the world, teaching the nations the law of Moses. Mark 16 verses 15 to 18 shows them as servants, healing people. Luke 24 verses 47 to 49 shows the little flock preaching. Repentance and Remission of Sins after they received power from on high, just like Jesus, as the perfect man, preached repentance and remission of sins after he received the Holy Ghost. John 20 verses 21 to 23 shows the little flock forgiving or retaining sins, which Jesus did as God. Therefore, the Great Commission is merely an extension of Jesus' ministry to the believing remnant through the power of the Holy Ghost, 
and the different aspects of the Great Commission are given in the four Gospels, according to the emphasis of each Gospel writer. They point out, what to them seems conclusive, that in this commission, as of course that in Matthew, water baptism is evidently linked with a profession of faith in Christ. They are perfectly hydrophobic as to this. The very thought of water sets them foaming with indignation. There must on no account be any recognition of water baptism during the present age. It must be gotten rid of at all costs. That was God's doing not Bollinger's doing. God tells us today that Paul was not sent to baptize people. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. So, why would we do something Christ has not sent us to do today? So here where we read that our Lord said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16 verses 15 and 16, which would seem to indicate worldwide evangelism, looking out to the proclamation of the glad glorious gospel of God to lost men everywhere. This commission must nevertheless be gotten rid of somehow. The commission was gotten rid of by Jesus Christ in Acts 9, and the apostles acknowledged this in Acts 15, according to Paul's account in Galatians 2 verses 7 to 9. We are just following what the Lord Jesus Christ said. We are not looking for excuses to get out of things. Besides, as I mentioned earlier, God replaced the Great Commission with an even greater commission. Why would I want to preach the Law of Moses, when I can preach reconciliation to God through the blood of Christ? The Law has no power to save, the power is in the blood. Water baptism cleansed the flesh, so that the priest could approach God, but it did not cleanse the soul. By being reconciled to God through the blood of Christ, I am spiritually baptized into Christ's death. Colossians 2 verse 12, which destroys the body of sin, Romans 6 verses 3 to 6. Why, then, would I go backward from a spiritual cleansing to a fleshly cleansing? The way they do it is this, the Lord declares that certain signs shall follow when this gospel is proclaimed. These signs evidently followed in the days of the Acts. They declare they have never followed since. Therefore, it is. evident that water baptism is only to go on so long as the signs follow. No. That's not true. Mark 16 verse 16 and Acts 2 verse 38 say that water baptism is required for salvation. It is part of the gospel. Then, we see, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17, that Christ sent Paul not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. This tells us that water baptism is not part of the gospel today, when it was part of the gospel in Israel's dispensation, therefore, it should not be followed today. This has nothing to do with signs. Signs continued until Acts 28, but water baptism for salvation stopped when the Lord Jesus Christ revealed new information to Paul in Acts 9. If the signs have ceased, then water baptism ceases. The signs are not here now, therefore no water baptism. How amazingly clear, though, as we shall see in a moment, absolutely illogical. The signs accompanied preaching the gospel. The reason signs accompanied preaching the gospel is because the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22. Since Paul stopped going to the Jews after Acts 28, the signs stopped at the end of Acts, but the gospel of grace for today continues. Why continue to preach if such signs are not now manifest? The Matthew Commission makes it plain that baptism in the name of the Trinity is to go on to the end of the age, how is that? The Matthew Commission says that Jesus will be with the disciples unto the end of the world. It does not say they are to water baptize people until the end of the world. If it does, then they are also to teach the law until the end of the world, because Matthew 28 verse 20 says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and Matthew 23 verses 1 to 3 tells us that those things are the law of Moses. Yet, Romans 6 verse 14 says we are no longer under the law, since it has been blotted out, Colossians 2 verse 14. Therefore, the information in Paul's epistles tells us that God has changed instructions with the change in dispensations at Acts 9, and that age has not come to an end yet, whatever changes of dispensation may have come in. If Ironside wants to use that logic, we can also quote OT passages that God says Israel will do forever and also try to apply those to us today. So, you cannot eat any meat with fat in it, due to Leviticus 3 verse 17, and you must be put to death for working on the Sabbath, according to Exodus 31 verses 15 to 16. Now what of this commission in Mark? 
Observe first of all that our Lord is not declaring that the signs shall follow believers in the gospel, which is to be proclaimed by the Lord's messengers. The signs were to follow those of the apostles who believed, and they did. Mark 16 verse 15 tells the eleven apostles to go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel. Mark 16 verse 16 then says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16 verse 17 then says, These signs shall follow them that believe. Following the flow of the passage, then, all those who believe would perform the signs. At first, this is the eleven, and we see from Mark 16 verse 20 that signs did follow them, but this would also include those who believe the gospel preached by the eleven. There were some of them who did not believe. See verse 11, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Then again, notice verse 13, they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. And in the verse that follows, we read, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now our Lord commissions the eleven, sends them forth, to go to the ends of the earth, preaching the gospel, to every creature. There is nothing limited here. It is not a Jewish commission. It has nothing to do with the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. That is not what Jesus told his disciples. In Matthew 10, Jesus gives the apostles a summary of how they are to fulfill the Great Commission. Jesus said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6. The message they would be preaching is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If that message was accepted, Jesus would have restored the kingdom to Israel. But, since it was rejected, the mystery dispensation began. However, note that the apostles asked Jesus, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1 verse 6. In Jesus' answer, he commissions them to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1 verse 8. The commission in Acts 1 verse 8 is the same as it is in Matthew, John, and this commission is in response to the question of restoring the kingdom to Israel. Therefore, this commission has everything to do with the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. It is a worldwide commission to go to all the Gentiles and to go forth preaching the word. Responsibility rests upon those who hear. They are to believe and be baptized. Those who do are recognized among the saved. On the other hand, he does not say, he that is not baptized shall be damned, because baptism was simply an outward confession of their faith, but he does say, He that believeth not shall be damned. Belief and baptism went together. You needed both for salvation. Without belief, baptism was irrelevant. Therefore, those who believed were baptized and were saved, while those who did not believe were damned, regardless of if they were baptized or not. If baptism was not required for salvation, Jesus would have said, He that believes shall be saved and should get baptized. Instead, he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Belief is the issue. All believers would be water baptized, because they believed. If they did not believe the gospel, then they would not get baptized. Therefore, baptism is not mentioned among unbelievers. Then in verses 17 and 18, we have what Paul later called the signs of an apostle. An apostle is a sent one. Thus, it is not limited to the twelve. The signs of an apostle could also be wrought through all those who believed and were water baptized when they heard the gospel of the kingdom. These signs shall follow them that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. During all the period of the book of Acts, these signs did follow the apostles. Signs continued until the Bible was completed, as 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10 tells us, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. That which is perfect is the Bible, while that which is in part the gifts of the Spirit mentioned in the previous chapter. These signs were for the Jews, and so they continued after Acts 7, because the Jews were given the chance to believe the gospel of the grace of God through the end of Acts. These signs happened among the Gentiles in Acts 9-28 to to provoke Israel to jealousy, Romans 11 verse 11. More than that, if we can place the least reliance upon early church history, the same signs frequently followed other servants of Christ, 
as they went forth in obedience to this commission, and this long after the imprisonment of the Apostle Paul. I do not place the least reliance. Upon early church history, but I place every reliance upon the 100% true word of God, John 17 verse 17. Trophimus traveled with Paul in proclaiming the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20 verse 4, yet Paul left Trophimus sick in Miletum, 2 Timothy 4 verse 20. If physical healings were still going on at that time, Paul would have healed Trophimus so he could help him in the ministry. The fact that he did not heal him shows that physical healings had ceased by then, regardless of what church history says. We should expect this from the closing verses of Mark. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Mark 16 verses 19 and 20. In this last verse, Mark covers the evangelization of the world, not merely a message going out to the Jews, if they went to the world at this time, then God is a liar, because he told them to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verse 6, and that ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come, Matthew 10 verse 23. Since Jesus' second coming has not taken place yet, their preaching everywhere, Mark 16 verse 20, must have been confined to everywhere in Israel. During all the years that followed until the last of the apostles, John himself, had disappeared from the scene. Why would the signs stop then, since Mark 16 verse 17 says these signs shall follow them that believe, which certainly would have included people saved by the ministry of the eleven apostles, Mark 16 verse 16, I do not mean to intimate that Mark knew this, but I do mean that the Spirit of God caused him so to write this closing verse as to cover complete apostolic testimony right on to its consummation. If the signs ceased after the last of the eleven apostles died, then Paul would not have had the signs, since they were limited to the eleven, and the Great Commission would have ceased at that time as well. Mark 16 verse 20 says, confirming the word with signs following, if the signs cease and the commission continues, then the word has no confirmation, and no one believes it. Therefore, Ironside's argument that the signs ceased, but the commission continued, is faulty. One cannot be separated from the other, because Jesus does not separate the one from the other. They preached everywhere, not simply in connection with Israel. Where is the evidence for this, before Acts 9? Even when there was a great persecution of the church in Acts 8, we are told they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, Acts 8 verse 1. The reason the apostles stayed in Jerusalem is because the Great Commission said, Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1 verse 8. The apostles understood this order and knew that they had not fully reached Jerusalem yet. Therefore, they stayed in Jerusalem, and even those who were scattered still stayed within Israel. Therefore, we do not see the little flock of Israel going to anyone outside of Israel with the gospel until the dispensational change in Acts 9. Yet in the face of this, the statement has been made over and over again by these ultra-dispensationalists that the twelve never went to the Gentiles, excepting in the case of the Apostle Peter and a few similar instances. Where is the proof that they went to the Gentiles? Acts 8 verse 1 says that the twelve apostles stayed in Jerusalem, and in Galatians 2 verse 9, they specifically agreed that they would go only unto the circumcision. I guess Ironside believes his own philosophies over the word of God. The statement has also been made that all miracles ceased with Paul's imprisonment, that there were no miracles afterwards. There are far more miracles today than there were in Jesus' day. A saved soul spiritually is far greater than a physical healing. Thus, millions of miracles have taken place in the grace dispensation. Of course, much like the Jews of Jesus' day, we tend to focus on the physical over the spiritual. Therefore, when referring to miracles, Ironside is talking about physical miracles. Where is his evidence that physical miracles are happening today? I am not talking about people being cured of a headache, backache, or of cancer. There are heat unbelievers who make similar claims of those ailments going away. I am talking about the physical miracles that happened in Jesus' day. Where are the people with no legs who magically grow legs and start walking? Where are the people who have been blind from birth? 
verified by at least two independent witnesses who have magically received their sight. If physical miracles were occurring today, we would see this because it would be proof positive that a miracle occurred rather than the so-called physical miracles we see today. What superb ignorance of church history is here indicated, and what an absurd position a man puts himself in who commits himself to negatives like these. Where is your proof, Ironside? An eminent logician has well said, never commit yourself to a negative, for that supposes that you are in possession of all the facts. I am in possession of all facts. I have the word of God, and God cannot lie, Titus 1 verse 2. Since he said that miracles would cease once the Bible is complete, I believe it. It is the 100% accuracy of God's word and the low accuracy of the church history that causes me to disregard church history in favor of God's word. I can competently commit to a negative when God has said the negative is so. If a man says there were no miracles wrought in the church after the imprisonment of the Apostle Peter, it means, if that statement is true, that he has thorough knowledge of all that has taken place in every land on earth where the gospel has been preached, in all the centuries since the days of Paul's imprisonment, and knows all the work that every servant of Christ has ever done. Otherwise, he could not logically and rationally make such a statement. God said that physical miracles have ceased today. That's all the evidence I need. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6. This is not some pie in the sky faith. Faith is believing what God has said. Instead, Ironside is relying upon what man has said. By Ironside's argument, no one could ever state that God created the earth because no one was there to see it. However, I know God created the earth because he said he created the earth. End of discussion. More importantly, no one today could ever receive eternal life apart from faith. What then is the conclusion? It is wrongly dividing. If I wrongly divide the word of truth, then how does Ironside rightly divide it? If it is merely Old and New Testament, there is no dividing done, because it is already divided into those areas for us. The word of truth to seek to rob Christians of the precious instruction given by our Lord Jesus in the four Gospels, Ironside's arguments wrongly divide the word of truth to rob Christians of the precious instructions given by our Lord Jesus Christ to us today in Paul's epistles. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 3 to 4 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid. To them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Most Christians do not rightly divide the word of truth, because they have allowed Satan to blind them with unbelief in God's word, though fully recognizing their dispensational place. It is an offense against Christian missions everywhere to try to set aside the Great Commission for the entire present age. I am glad I am offending Christian missions everywhere, because nearly all Christian missions do not present a clear gospel message, which makes people more settled in the lake of fire, instead giving them life in Christ in heaven, Matthew 23 verse 15, For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. It is not true that a definite limit is placed in scripture upon the manifestation of sign gifts and that such gifts have never appeared since the days of the apostles. The purpose of the sign gifts is a shadow of the spiritual things to come, Colossians 2 verse 17, so that people may believe the gospel and have eternal life. Since the word of God is now complete, we have the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4 verse 13. Therefore, God discarded the shadow for the real deal.